If I need a child volunteer who has a hard time sitting still, come on up, buddy. All right, hand went right up. All right. <laughs> All right, Evan, the church, church, Evan, all right, and I need one other volunteer to, uh, Christian, all right, Christian, you can actually stay right there if you, if you want to, all right, Evan, here is, here is your mission, if you choose to accept it, don't say yes because you don't know, so what, what is it yet, but, all right, during my talk here, I want you to be still. Here, wait, I'll, I'll let you, there, you can get front and center, look at that. All right, I want you to be still. Christian, I want you to count how many times he moves. Now, don't count eye blinks, all right? Eye blinks don't, don't matter, all right? And, and yes, you, you can breathe. That's good. All right, so, <laughs> so when I say go, you ready? You good? All right, good, cool. So we uh, pick up. Um, our journey uh, in Exodus, and Pharaoh has um, uh, let God's people go at a miraculous signs and miraculous wonders that he showed for the purpose of having the people know that Yahweh, that God, is the God of Israel, the God of all gods. Who are the people? Israel the Egyptians, and Pharaoh. Now, if, if you have missed any of these, this is part six. They're online, they're on our website, and also Facebook. Please feel free to, uh, to I know I'm going to be outstage the entire time, and that's fine with me. So, doing good. All right. Um, so, feel free to go and to watch uh, ones that, that, that uh, you have missed. But today, we're talking about when, God, when God's people are finally being let go now. And so we pick up in Exodus chapter 14, beginning with verse 5. Exodus 14, beginning with the fifth verse. I'm going to kind of narrate as we go, so I'll pause here and there. Um, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with, other, with all the other chariots of, of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pihiroth, opposite of Baal Zephon. Let's pause there for a moment. Um, I was going to have a nice big map out here. If you actually go back, Jim, to that, that scripture, um, please, as to where the possible route of the Exodus was. But I thought, you know, no one really knows for sure. There are people who think they know, uh, and there are some pretty good uh, guesses as to where. Um, probably, in my opinion, maybe the northeast part of um, Egypt, because we don't know where some of these towns are now. But I want to focus here real quick on verse, the end of verse 8. Again, you can read through Scripture. How's it going? Thumbs up? He moved. That's one. Oh, I got you. <laughs> I'm bad. Sorry. It's just couldn't really. Um, we can read through Scripture and just over, glance over some verses that maybe we just don't get. But what caught me, the end of verse 8, So the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were what? Marching out boldly. Some translations have marching out defiantly with their fists raised up. Why do you think they're doing that? How many years had they been in Egypt? 
over 400, right? And they were hard pressed, they were slaves, they were made to work and work hard. Now finally, after all of these 10 plagues, they finally go and, and they take the gold and silver from, from, from the Egyptians and they march out and they're there. Why do you think they're doing that? Why would you, would you do that? Marching out because, hey, it's to me, I mean, we're, we're, it's extrapolation here. Take that, Pharaoh. Yeah. In your face, Pharaoh. We're out of here. See ya. Defiantly. Boldly. Who let, who freed Israel? God, right? Okay, hold that. Hold that thought. So if, 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 if God's doing it for him, why would you, ha, yeah, take that. Just hold that for a minute. We continue on to verse 10 of chapter 14. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up. And they were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, now let's put this as pause there. So as they're, as they're camped out, right, um, and prior to, to these verses, God sent them out. And God put a pillar of, of, of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night in front of them to guide them where to go, all right, to help out. During the Exodus, God told Moses, you know what, go back and change directions and go this way. Uh, and basically that route led them to be trapped uh, behind a valley and a lake or some, some kind of body of water where there was no way out. And God said to, to Moses, Pharaoh will think that you're lost and trapped, but this is my plan to show Pharaoh and the Egyptians my power. So they change routes and they go and now they're, they, are, they are locked um, with a lake on this side and a, a mountain on this side and they can't get out. And Pharaoh goes, how we, we have him now, and they see, the Israelites see the Egyptians coming. This, this word here, overtake, um, uh, says uh, in verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the, the Israelites looked up, and they were, uh, they were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us here in the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Moses, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. How are they marching out of Egypt? Boldly and defiantly. Well, what's their attitude right now? Fear. In verse 10, they were terrified. Perhaps it's a little bit of poetic justice. God reminding them, it wasn't you. Why do you have a right to brag about it? I am your warrior and not you. So from a, a distance, they try to see him come, and, they're, and they are, what are you doing back here? <laughs> Do you want to preach for me? Huh? You had one goal, you had one mission. What was the mission? Don't move. How many times Christians over? That many. <laughs> <laughs> 39 times he counted so far. Do you think you've passed or do you think you've failed so far? You passed. You've <laughs> he's, he's, he's passed. Good. I'll give you one more chance. All right. Start from zero. <laughs> Don't move. Got it? Be still. How do you get 
when you get scared and afraid besides scared and afraid <laughs> when things don't go the way you think they're going isn't it easy to lash out at someone and you get angry and I, I had mentioned this you know, prior anger is not a base emotion it's a secondary emotion that, 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 that derives from being hurt but also scared the opposite of this how many times Christian? five times and that's in like one minute wow do you think that, that, that you're good at being still? <laughs> I'm not sure he knows what the, what the word still means. If you do that, right? Well, I want to thank you for, thank you for playing. I will, I will give you uh, an award afterwards. All right? For the most unstill still person I ever met. All right. Good job. Give me a hand, please. Now, who is good at, at being still? Who thinks you're great? And you, being asleep doesn't count. Christian? <laughs> you're right. Any volunteers for our opposite end? You, you're going to kill you. <laughs> Anybody? Claire, you want to try it? All right, Christian, come up. And in poetic justice, guess who's going to be your judge? Evan. <laughs> Count how many times he moves, all right? Okay, have a seat. Move. Don't move. <laughs> Don't get knocked out. Doesn't count. Ready? Don't move. That's your mission. Don't move. Be, be still. Okay, go. When you're scared, you can lash out. Right? And look at the things that they said to, uh, to Moses. Was it because there weren't in a, in, in any graves in Egypt? Egypt was full of tombs and graves. It was sarcasm. What have you done to us by bringing us here? Didn't we say, just, just leave us alone? And they wanted to be slaves. As opposed to facing the death by Pharaoh in the desert. What just happened to these people? What did God just do for them? What did they experience over the course of the past 12 months? What, Christian? Thumbs up? He moved. That counts too. Sorry. You fell for it. Through a process of 10 plagues over 12 months. He demonstrated his authority over nature, over the Egyptian gods, over Pharaoh himself. And do you think that God did all of that to have them be killed by Pharaoh? But don't get too hard on the Israelites. Because very easily we can put ourselves there. How many times have we been, 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 been blessed by God? And he has brought us through things only to seemingly the next day, the next week forget and lash out at somebody or be critical at somebody or gossip about somebody or say things or do things that we shouldn't do just look what God did for you so it's easy for us to look back in history and point fingers when in all reality we have to say you know are we any better than them but they turned on Moses and said we should have stayed there what was Moses' response Chapter 13, 14, verse 13. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see that the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. I'm going to comment on this in just a moment because this is the main crux of today's message. But there's three things here. 
if we continue with this narrative, then the Lord said to Moses, well, first, where are we? How many times, Evan? 102? 19. 19. Wow. See, that's what you get for judging harshly. He's doing the same back to you. See? Don't judge, you'll be judged. That's one of the things that I... 19, but yeah, I'm pretty still. And the Lord says, it said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will rain glory through Pharaoh and all of his army. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all of his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Verse 19, Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from the, in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on the dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Verse 23. And the Egyptians pursued them. And all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed him into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of, of the chariots come off so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Verse 26, And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it. And the Lord swept them into in, in the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the, the, the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through on dry ground, with a wall of water on the right and on the left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the, the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, their servant. How many times? 29, 29 times. How many times did, did he move? <laughs> All right. Game over. How many times did he move? 39. All right, good job. Have a seat. Give me a hand, please. Turn back to chapter, to, to, to verse 13, please. And there was a point to that. There usually is. Verse 13 of chapter 14. Takeaways. Moses answered the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the, the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The Israelites were the people, that, the nation that God chose. Not because they were special. Not because they were better than, than the Canaanites or the Egyptians. But God chose because he wanted to. To have them as an example. To build a relationship with them. To be an example for the world. Of what God can do. And he built his covenant with Israel. Again, not because of their goodness or their merit, but because of God's grace. 
that looking now at this side of, of the cross, from that nation, from the line of David, came Christ. In the time of Exodus, all those years, how many hundreds of years, 400 plus, that God was shaping, was using that in, in slavery and bondage to sharpen, to mature, to grow. Was there a better way? I don't know. Probably not. But after those centuries, God said, okay, it's time. I heard their cries. It's time to be free. And God was going to free them, but have them be an example, not just to the Israelites, but to Egypt as to who God really is. And he was going to do that by showing that there's no other God, including Pharaoh, who thought himself as a God, on par with Yahweh, with the Lord after the 10th plague and they leave so you got, got kind of cocky we're out of here we're going and they go God changed Pharaoh's heart Israelites changed from being cocky to being scared wow what's happening Lord what are you doing Moses what's we doing his response number one number one don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Daniel 3, 16 and 18, if you remember the book of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for those who like veggie tales, Rack, Shack, and Benny, when they would not bow down to the king and worship, tossed into a fiery furnace, and he challenged, the king challenged him, now who will save you? And their answer, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before this, you in this, in this matter. If we are thrown into the, into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. This next verse is phenomenal. Say it together, that first phrase. But even if he does not, but even if he does not, but even if he does not save us from certain death, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. God is able to save you. God was able and it was to save Rack, Shack, and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and uh, Abednego. I watched too many cartoons. <laughs> Did they know that they would be saved? No. According to this, our God will save us, but if he doesn't, we're fine. Israelites who fought on their behalf through Egypt if you fast forward through Joshua and the conquest of Canaan who fought for Israel was it because of their strength and their might and their power that they conquered Canaan that they left Egypt God was their warrior God was their defender God was their God. And so when we, we see, don't be afraid, why shouldn't they be afraid? What's the opposite of, of fear? Anybody know? Faith. Faith is the opposite of fear. Scripture teaches that perfect faith drives out fear. If your faith is in yourself, I would be scared. But Moses says, don't be afraid. Why? And take away number two. Stand firm. Why should you stand firm? 
Verse 13. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Stand firm, which means don't move, which means don't run away out of fear. Stand, stay, and watch. Take away three. I'm oh, sorry. Let's go uh, to Matthew 10.22 real quick. He who stands firm to the end will be, will be saved. That's what Christ says to his church. That you will, we will go through persecution, but you must stand firm and have faith, not fear. 1 Corinthians 10.11. Paul is talking about some things that, that the church uh, in Corinth is going through. And writes, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Like Israel, leaving defiantly. Then just, not that two verses later, being terrified again. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what, what you can bear. But when, you are, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can stand up under pressure. In this context, here, Israel was scared because they thought after all of that, God was going to abandon them and, and have them be killed by Pharaoh and his army. Moses says, don't be afraid. Stand firm. Number three, be still. Evan, why is it hard to be still? I asked the questions here, buddy. Not you. Sorry. You have a future pastor here, a professor here. I don't know. He's next, but what, why is it hard for you to, to, to stand still, to be still? Can I see your creature, please? So, um, he, he blamed his inability to be still on this. <laughs> just, just to be clear. And, and then blamed it on his sister. <laughs> well, what is this thing? That's cool. It has two heads. There you go. So notice. I don't think she's very scared about that. But notice what was his first response? I asked him why is he so distracted? And this well, this is not scripted by the way. It works perfectly. What's his first response? Blame someone else. Where do you see this in scripture for the first time? The garden. Great example. Thank you, Evan. Why have you disobeyed me? Why, you, the woman you gave me did it. And she said, oh, the serpent that you made did it. Christian, why is it hard for you to sit still? Because of Liana? Is that why? <laughs> because of El Liana. What was she doing to you? Making him laugh. And she was... <laughs> she was making him laugh and she was disobeying mom. Notice how it's... <laughs> Why is it so hard to be still? Distractions. And we can blame... Cell phone age, we can blame the, the, the media age, we can, we can blame our schools, the bad influences, we can blame our parents, we can blame our friends, we can blame whoever else. Guess what? And if I had a mirror here, I, I, I would preach me first. Who has the choice to be distracted or not? There can be distractions, but how do you overcome them? We all want to grow closer to God, I, I think. I think that's a pretty safe assumption. 
We have these lofty goals. We want to, we want to grow. We want, we want to be close to God. We want this, this church packed out. But how do you get there? How do you, how do you eat an elephant? Time. How were the Israelites distracted? There is this large honking army coming to kill us. <laughs> but they forgot they even had a visible manifestation of God there in a the cloud and fire. I don't have that. <laughs> It'd be kind of cool on, 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 on the one hand, right? But then again, I would have less excuse. <laughs> God, I kind of saw your cloud there and I still disobeyed you. Because they took their eyes off of the promise God gave them and focused rather on the obstacle not on God. Be still. Psalm 46, 8 through 11. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. Be still. And know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I'm not sure why I'm crying now. <laughs> Must be that uh, little house on the prairie thing this week. <laughs> I think I do know why. I think... And this isn't scripted in, in my prayer too. God relishes when his children, when his people participate with him. Think about if you're a parent or a grandparent or a great grandparent or an aunt or uncle. Or, or if you're a teacher and you have kids, you know, in your class or whatever, and when, when they willingly want to be a part of what you're doing, you don't have to bribe them, you don't have to punish them, you don't have to discipline them. They truly want to be with you and to help you do what you're doing. I think that's how God is. And we get so distracted in our own agendas with technology and games, the building of wealth and prestige and power that we forget. We're gone. Be still. And know, not just a head knowledge, but know. I know about George Washington but I don't know him because he's dead. I can read my scripture and go through decades of training and know about God and hope that that knowledge translates into knowing him personally, but it's not guaranteed. Folks, no matter if you're five or 99 or before or after, the Lord, the same Lord, the same Yahweh, the same God of the Israelites in this Bible that can part waters, that can send plagues, that can heal the sick and raise the dead is alive now and here now. There's no pillar of cloud. There's no fire. But there should be right here a burning fire. And too often we can have distractions, squelch it, and squelch it, put it out. That is not to be you. That is not to be us. We are not to say, oh pff, God, well, gee, thanks, I'm, I'm a Christian, I follow you, now look what's happened, my, my wife died, my husband died, I, I lost my job, I have no home, I'm sick, 
Where are you? Thanks a lot. Or fill in your own scenario. And I'm not raising those to be condescending. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up to make a point for myself, too, that we don't know why things happen the way they do. But God does. And I have to trust Him, that He knows. I can't control the things that are out of my control. That's kind of obvious. <laughs> But I can be responsible for how I react and be proactive in the things and people that I have influence with and under. That's my challenge for you today. Whatever situation you're in that you may be afraid, you are not acting in faith. Which means you are not getting closer to God, but you are getting away from God. How do you stop that? Standing firm, being still. And there's no point four, but you can have faith and not be afraid and be still and stand firm. What was the last part of Psalm 23? Many of you know that by heart. When you get past the imagery of the shepherd and the sheep, what's the last image there? You prepare a table before me in front of my enemies. We can so trust God with our lives that he will throw you a banquet in the middle of an ISIS camp and you will be safe. Oh, to have that faith. And what do we exchange it for? A bowl of soup. Wasting time on stupid games or phones or shows or things that really don't matter. Pursuing of wealth and fame, whatever else. Folks, be still. I encourage you. Make it, make it, make it a priority in your life. And parents and grandparents, model this for our kids. That's why I at least try to incorporate a small time of quiet of prayer because not many take the time to be quiet and folks that's how God often speaks in that quill quill still quill is quiet and still together by the way a still quiet voice and I will promise you this God will meet you God will answer you but it may not be when you want it, where you want it, and how you want it. But he will. That's what God does. God is our warrior. And he will fight for you. Where's the battleground? Right here. Father, I pray 